Welcome to Construct Tech TV, and I'm Peggy Smedley. Time and time again, I hear that the one item that both Democrats and Republicans can agree on is that we need more funding for infrastructure. Now, if this is really the case, then why is the United States ranked ninth for infrastructure by the World Economic Forum's Global Competitiveness Report? Our financial system and the business dynamism come in number one. Now, why is our innovation capability comes in number two, only behind Germany? Now, I keep giving you all these numbers, right? Then why is our infrastructure lagging behind other countries? It just makes me so frustrated. That is what I'm going to explore here today as we dive into the current state of our nation's infrastructure. It has been very widely reported that America's infrastructure scores a D plus on the 2017 infrastructure report card. Now you've heard me talk about this for the past couple of years. In the past year, however, we have been seeing many of the states announce their 2018 report cards. Pennsylvania, for instance, received a grade of a C minus, while Mon Montana earned itself a C. However, over in Nevada, it also netted a C. This is extremely encouraging. I, I really, it is, if you look at this. But a lot of work still needs to be done. I don't want you to get your hopes too high. But let's take a look at our current administration's infrastructure initiative. In February of last year, President Trump announced six key principles to fix our failing infrastructure. First, it will invest $200 billion in federal funds to spur at least $1.5 trillion in infrastructure investments. Next, new investments will be made in rural America. Third, decision-making authority will actually be returned to state and local governments. Also, regulatory barriers will be removed. The administration will also streamline and shorten permitting for infrastructure projects. Now, I actually think this is long overdue if you ask me about this. Finally, it will support and strengthen America's workforce. There's so much to impact here, but I think the real key takeaway is that it recognizes that we are underperforming and it is beginning to address it. Yet policy and investment is only one part of the overall equation. Understandably, a very important portion, but I believe there's another component that needs to be addressed here as well and that is how technology is advancing. Now, let me explain. There is a real opportunity for infrastructure to become a little bit smarter with the help of technology. Embedded sensors, as we, as we have talked about, can keep us connected to our infrastructure in ways we have never imagined. We can collect and interpret data to make better decisions about the health of our structures all around us. The good news is technology is advancing and new price points are starting to come down. And we are seeing the advent of the Internet of Things, sensors, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and digital transformation, all of which will alter global economies. The challenge with implement emerging technologies really boils down to three big areas. First is naturally funding, but the second is interoperability. And I want you to think about that. Implementing new emerging technologies in legacy applications, perhaps one of the biggest hurdles we will face today in all industries, but certainly when building smart cities and infrastructure. We need a common data protocol to connect all of these systems and to communicate in a way that makes sense for all of the parties. And the final challenge, of course, no matter what we think about, is security. And I can't stress this enough. Connecting our infrastructure leaves us vulnerable to digital attacks. We always have to keep our eyes open to all of those nefarious characters, all of those bad guys. Now is the time for the technology community to come together to put the right safeguards in place to protect our infrastructure. 
I think it's only when we all come together in construction, government, and the technology community that great things will happen and we'll really begin to bring up our grade and our global ranking. Now is the time. But the real question is, do you have what it takes to make it happen? You want to leave a legacy people will remember. You need your projects on time, on budget, and with quality you can stand behind. With the Trimble Constructible process, you can build with confidence, using data so accurate, every person and team can work together for shared success. Trimble's constructible process is more than visualization. It's a total digital transformation. So when you look at your final creation, you can sit back, relax, and say, I built that. Whatever you can imagine, Trimble Constructible can build. Trimble. It's been very widely reported that the American Society of Civil Engineers gave our America's infrastructure only a D plus. The real question is why? Today I'm joined by Christina Swallow, the 2018 president of ASCE. Christina, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I, I really want to know, Christina, if you could tell us why our society is looking at a crumbling infrastructure and it's still not getting better. I guess they really all want to know why. You know, Peggy, that's a really good question. And I wish I had a good answer for it. Now, the, the first part of that answer is we've been underinvesting in our infrastructure for decades. So the American Society of Civil Engineers releases this report card every four years. The most recent report card was released in 2017. We've never had a grade outside of the Ds. And I don't know about you, but I brought home a D once, and it was it did not go over, Yeah, it did not go over very well at all. Our grades increased from a D to a D plus in 2013, but then held stable at a D plus in 2017. And there was some shifting in there. Seven of the grades actually went up, three fell, and the rest remained stable. But the problem is, is this is hurting us as Americans. It's hurting our economy. It's hurting our individual family checkbooks. And we need to fix it. You know what's hurting our checkbooks even more? What's hurting everything? We got a bunch of politicians who can't even play nice in Washington. Look what we've been going on for how many weeks now in Washington? If we can't fix our infrastructure and they can't get along in, in, in Washington right now, how are we going to get anything done? You know, that is, that is such a good point. And one of the things we've been talking about a lot lately is that the first step that we need to do today is we need to end the shutdown. And then we're calling on Congress to take up infrastructure as the first item of business when they come back. President Trump has indicated he wants to work on infrastructure. Speaker Pelosi has indicated she wants to work on infrastructure. The American public, in a recent survey by Politico and the Harvard School of Health, actually says 79% of the public thinks it, think it's, think it's important that we invest in our infrastructure. Extremely important. With over almost 90% of Democrats and over 80% of Republicans on that same page. It's extremely important to invest in our infrastructure. So they need to end the shutdown, come back to work, and get started on investing in our economy. Christina, you and I have had this conversation so many times before. They both say they want infrastructure, but why can't they just understand? And I say this to everybody I have on the show. Do, are we going to have a catastrophic event before both sides, Republicans and Democrats, really see how serious this is right now? Gosh, I hope not, though. But I mean, is that what it gonna, it's going to take? I, and I don't want that. No, no, not, nobody wants that. But unfortunately, we have seen that when there is a catastrophic event, they do come together and it does get done. We don't want that to happen this time. We know, you know our, I would argue that it is somewhat catastrophic already. $3,400 a year out of a family's pocketbook, that, out of their disposable income, that is being spent on infrastructure that's not meeting our needs. We're paying for power outages. We're paying... Um, extra costs in freight for our milk and for our clothes and for our school books when they have to go around bridges that are load rated. We're paying for drinking water that's never making it to the tap. I would say $3,400 or $9 a day per family is, is catastrophic. You and I get that, but why is it we can't get the average consumer to really rise up and say enough's enough? I mean, you know, we get that, but why do we need to get the voices? Because when the consumers say, I've had enough, boy, those voices can be heard. But we're not making enough of an outcry to say, we want change. You know, that is, 
if I could figure out that problem, I would. And I think one of our challenges is that as engineers, we've done, I'm going to say, a good enough job of patching our system, of keeping the system limping along, such that it's not front of mind for most Americans. Front of mind is, how are they going to pay their bills? How are they going to get their kid from school to soccer? How are they going to um, make sure that their, their mortgage and, their, and they have put food on the table? So that's what they're thinking about, right? And they're thinking about safety, but they're not thinking about when they're stuck in traffic, they don't realize that there is a fix. And all they have to do is call Congress and say, we need you to act. You know, when they're stuck at an airport, they don't realize that there's an easy fix to just re get rid of the passenger facility charge. You know, there are easy fixes, but as the public, and I would argue even you and I, I'll, I'll say, like, when I get stuck in traffic, I'm not thinking Congress can help me. Yeah. Right? I'm not calling saying, help me. And so we need, as, as interested parties and as stakeholders and those that, I'm going to say the doctors of our infrastructure, right? We're the stewards of our infrastructure. We need to continue to beat the drum so that the public starts to hear it. Do you think in small regions, you've seen your latest report cards coming out, you've seen, and there's been slight improvements, you've seen what's been happening in Pennsylvania and Montana, the new report cards are coming out, and, and there's been a slight upward shift, and you see, you know, you go from a D to a D minus to a D, and, and that's from a C to a C, you know, C minus upward, those slight improvements, that says we're moving in the right, we're moving the needle, but it's not enough. But every improvement is a little improvement. Does that say we're doing enough, or it's going to be a long time before we really see some really great improvements? We are moving the needle. It is going to take us a long time. It is good to see that it is being moved. And the, and the reason, so where we're seeing improvements. So you can say at a national level where we're seeing improvements, and you can also say at a state level where we're seeing those improvements. Those improvements are generally a function of investment. So our highest grade on the national report card is, a, is in, in rail, it's a B. And it's because the freight rail stakeholders have invested in their infrastructure to the tune of 27 billion in 2015 alone. They've invested in their infrastructure, their infrastructure is being improved so that it can move the freight across our country. And we're seeing that over in the last five years, over half of the states have increased their state fuel tax and so we're starting to see benefits from that. However, it's not the state's job alone. The states are starting to do what they have to do because they can't wait on the federal government anymore, but the federal government needs to come to the table. The time is now. But is it the states that are actually pushing things along that, it, unfortunately, if we don't get the states to do something, it's going to get worse and worse, and at least by the states doing something, we're seeing some progress, but now to really see that really dramatic change, it's got to be the federal government now that really steps it up. So we see it on transportation and other areas that you're talking about, aviation, all the other things that are involved in transportation. Yeah, 50% of the transportation, surface transportation funding, 50% of that is federal funding. So if the federal government doesn't step up, we're not going to get there. You know, on the other hand, there's, there's elements of our infrastructure like levees. So that grade on a national level did come up. It's still not good. It did come up in the last report card because we're starting to inventory our national levy system. But we've not fully funded the national levy program. So until we fully fund that program, we're only going to just chip away at it. We're never going to make significant progress on it. When we talk about autonomous vehicles, we talk about electric cars and things like that, the federal government is going to have to get involved at some point because we are going to see who's going to take responsibility for all of those things. And the government is. But are we talking about getting to a level five in order to have these vehicles? We're talking years away. So we get all stoked about these cars and vehicles on the road, but we have problems that are now. I mean, do we really need to really open our eyes to what we're talking about when we talk about technology and some of these things. We're investing, but we're a long way before it's really going to have an impact. You know, I know that you love talking about technology. And so I, I was thinking about technology on the way over here. And, you know, autonomous vehicles are one of those areas of technology that we're going to reap a lot of benefits from them. I mean, safety, 
safety, if, if there's anything, safety is one of the ones that we're just automatically going to start to see benefits from, from the technology we're seeing in our vehicles. Already, the ve what we have in our vehicles today is already making our roads safer, right? On the same end, if they can improve the congestion, right? Because they, they'll use less space, they'll be able to move together if we get to that level five. Mm -hmm. However, if we don't have the proper policies in place, we could actually see a very different outcome where congestion is worse because we're okay sitting in a car that isn't going anywhere because we're able to work. Or we're okay, you know, we just start ordering more food to be delivered, right? Or more packages to, and we don't really think about the impact on our network. And so you may, we could actually increase congestion by increasing vehicle miles. Now you've just painted a whole new picture that everyone's going, wow, I'm just gonna hang out in my car all day long because I just have food delivered to me, packages <laughs> delivered to right. me, I just hang it out. It's a beautiful nest egg of wonderful world I have there. Well, but it could be bad for our roads, right? Yeah, I and mean, so but I never imagined people thinking, well, it's comfy, cozy here. I just get everything delivered to me in my vehicle. Well, I wasn't meaning in your vehicle, <laughs> but the concept that you could, that it wouldn't matter if you were stuck in traffic as much because you could be productive, right? Right. On the other hand, there's technology that's out there right now that we really do know the benefits of and we're yeah. starting to see the benefits of. So sensors in our water lines that are telling us where there's a water line break well before it becomes a right. huge incident, right? When you have just a seeping water line, line leak, that, that's not a big deal to fix, but if you let it seep, for decades, or even for years, it can start to create a much larger problem. That can be catastrophic. That can be ca catastrophic. So the sensors that we're seeing being put into our infrastructure is already having a significant impact on our infrastructure. And there's other forms of technology. Um, in Las Vegas, they're using a technology that can predict, using big data, it can predict potential crashes up to two hours in advance of the potential crash. So they can locate emergency personnel, where they maybe need to be better located to help. They can reroute traffic. They can change signal timing to help uh, alleviate the congestion on one road and put it onto others. And they're using data to help make our, make our roads not just safer, but flow better. So in Seattle and many other places, they're starting to use um, managed lane and, and looking at the speed and how they can manage the speed on their roadway network to help improve flow over time, so it's not just always posted at 65 or 45 miles an hour, they manage it throughout the day to make sure that the vehicles are moving at the pace that is most effective for the roadway. So technology is helping us. Well, we're seeing what's happening in, in Colorado. CDOT's doing a whole mm -hmm. lot already, trying to test what can happen and really see and expand how using transportation systems. And there's a lot of really great things that can happen from that that we wanna see. But at the same time, we have to look at, we can't wait till 2020 or 2050 or whatever that next level five is gonna be. So the real question now, as you've seen, and you see the next report card that's gonna come out for what ACE is gonna look at, and they're working on it, do you see that we're moving that needle right now that you feel confident, you know, as the as the president, you know, in 2018, you know, are you feeling that, wow, we're really making great strides overall or like what you just described that, no, I can't reveal what the report card, we're still working on it, but everyone you, asks you. You've been trying to get me to give I, you the answer. I, I am, I always am. <laughs> That's my job as a good reporter, you know. The next report card is due out in 2021 four years from 2017, and we're actually just now starting to uh, dig in, build the committee, the committee of you know, volunteer experts, civil engineers who work in the various categories. We're building that committee, and we're going to start doing the data research later this year and early into next. So I unfortunately cannot tell you <laughs> what, and I don't have a crystal ball, I can't tell you what's going to happen. I'd like to tell you that starting this week, Congress came back, they worked on an infrastructure bill, they passed an, a broad-based infrastructure spending bill that included sufficient funding for our networks and that in 2021 we could reflect that there was a change. Not only did they pass the legislation, but they funded the programs and we started to see change. I'd like to say, I'd like to say that we could say that. I don't know that we're going to be able to. Can we say there's some action that all of us, every contractor out there, Everybody who's involved in building a road, building a home, building a, a building 
can do to take some action to help what we're doing right now? Yeah, we can all call Congress. That's what we need to do. Where we've seen states increase their state fuel tax, it's been because every one of the stakeholders has gotten involved and they've talked to their friends and they've talked to their neighbors and they've talked to the PTA and they talked to their tailor and they talked to their dance teacher and, in every, and they told them how important it was to invest in our infrastructure. And, so, and then they called Congress or they called their state legislature or they called their local councilmen. When we've done that, we've been successful. We need to do it now. We need a louder voice. We, we need, need to do more, voice. and we need to all get and take an active role, mm -hmm. is what you're saying. Yes. Well, Christina Swallow, I appreciate all the time you spent with the past president of ASCE. You know, I hope you'll come back and keep being that voice of change for us in our infrastructure. Well, thank you so much for having me, Peggy. It's always great to talk about our infrastructure. Well, we love that. All right, well, that's all the time we have for today. As you can see, you can all take an active voice, and the louder the voice we have, the greater the change we can make in our infrastructure. Transportation funding and priorities are changing both nationally and regionally. For instance, the Midwest saw many new governors elected in the November 2018 elections, and new trends are emerging in the region, both in public transit and aviation. Here to talk with me about it today is Dave Crossan, Division Operations Officer and Senior Vice President of HNTB Corporation. Dave, welcome to the show. Peggy, thank you for having me. So Dave, let's talk about the biggest transportation infrastructure priorities that you're seeing actually in the Midwest. So I think the Midwest is indicative of the entire country when it comes to funding for transportation, funding for infrastructure. There really isn't enough funding underneath the current gas tax that we get from the federal government. So we really need to address funding. And specifically in the Midwest with all the congestion we have between rail, freight, passenger and vehicular traffic. Now, in your mind, is this different than, let's say, the rest of the part of the country? Because I, I, as I look at it, this is indicative of the entire country that we have. And in the Midwest is just a part of it. But we have to tackle this, I would suspect, regionally, because we can't seem to get bipartisan agreement on any funding right now. So maybe the best way to address it is regionally to even try to solve some of these issues right now. It, you know, Indiana is a great example of how a state is trying to address their infrastructure needs. So Indiana has P3 legislation, so they're able to tap the private sector. Um, they just recently increased their gas tax, which is a short-term solution. Um, and then also they're looking at expanding tolling within the state, a user fee-based way to capture revenue to investing in infrastructure. Now, looking at that, investing in tolling, are there other ideas that they're able to do to make things work that are successful? Because we look at technology, we look at taxes. Taxes aren't the only thing that are successful, right? Right. right. So, so let's go back to the base of where most of our infrastructure funding comes from. It comes from the federal government, and for transportation, it comes from the gas tax which hasn't been raised since 1993. It's 18 cents for vehicles, 24 cents for, for diesel vehicles. Um, and it just hasn't kept up with the changing in our, our technology. You know, we have uh, battery powered vehicles, electric vehicles that we don't capture any revenue from when it comes to vehicle miles traveled. That's a concept uh, that's being looked at in Oregon as a pilot program where you actually would calculate and or collect the number of miles traveled and then base the user fee or the tax on the miles traveled. So yes, we have to take a look at technology and, and to get through what, what's changing in our infrastructure, which is autonomous vehicles, connected vehicles, um, those types of, of new things that are happening in our industry. And we're seeing a proliferation of new technology. When we talk about EVs, autonomous, connected cars, connected rail, all the things that we're talking about. And we aren't at stage five yet in any of these things. And we see that that's happening. By the time that all of these things happen, buses, cars, bikes, all of these connected elements that I should say, you know, for connected vehicles that are going to be out there. And we don't even know what's coming yet, right? And all these connected right. toys, so to speak, that are going to be the way that get us from point A to 
point B, if we put taxes on them or whatever to help us fund, is that going to be something that's going to have to be spearheaded by a governor who's going to have to champion this? Because we don't see the private sector just saying, hey, I'm going to pop up some money on this. Where are we going to get the funds or the initiation to make this happen? Who's going to actually drive the idea behind that? Right. So, yes, you'll, you'll see in, on a state level um, the gas tax increase, if you will, Okay, but once again, increasing the gas tax without indexing it for future um, is a short-term solution to a funding problem. Um, again, I mentioned Oregon and their vehicle miles traveled. Um, that's something else they're looking at, but the driving force behind funding for infrastructure is gonna come from the federal government, but the private sector plays a very big role in the technology that they're developing that now, and like you said, there's technology being developed today, yet we're building roads that probably won't, encom won't encompass that technology. And that's where a company like HNTB, we fit in the middle of that. We work with the private sector in their new technology and connected vehicle, autonomous vehicles. And how's, how does that relate to the public sector who's basically paying for all of these things? The Illinois Tollway, is now looking at putting uh, charging throughout a lane in their system so that the electric vehicles can be charged while they're driving down the Illinois Tollway. So we have all these sensors, as you're describing, in the roads, in the infrastructure that's gonna track and keep tabs, data, so to speak, on everything that's happening. But as we, the consumer, see all this, and it's miles traveled that's going to provide the data on all this, are consumers going to then embrace technology, or are they going to be fearful of technology because now we're keeping tabs on every single element of the commuting part, from our insurance, from the miles we've driven, to every part of where we've been and where we go and where we want to be? Are we going to be comfortable with that? It, you know, it's interesting. It, it goes into the millennials have had smartphones in their pockets since they were born almost. And, you know, that tracks you everywhere you move. But there is a segment of the population who has a fear of being tracked in their vehicle and where they're driving. Um, but I think more and more as people start to understand technology and understand what it's being used for and understand what data is already out there about yourself, um, that they'll realize that this is just another way to fairly collect fees from people who are using a system um, like the tollway tolls people, you know, that's a, that's a fair collection of fees for you driving on that road. Um, if we can do that across the United States with vehicle miles traveled, then people will say, okay, I'm paying my fair share of when I drive, and they can have a comfort level in that the data is actually matching their distance that they're driving. Are we honestly, though, we're, we're not even close to level five. So that fear that maybe we have to overcome is, is really unwarranted because you just described, let's say, Generation Z or whatever that is born with that phone that doesn't even care about being tracked. To those that might, the baby boomers and older who have those fear aren't really going to have to be fearful because we're not there where we're seeing connected roads just yet. It's going to be years away before we have all those. Absolutely, absolutely. So that's where we get back to present day. How do we invest in our infrastructure in short term? And, you know, I, I used Indiana as an example. You know, we really kind of have to look at a gas, entry, gas increase on a short term basis, indexing it until we can as a industry and as a, a government get people comfortable with a new way for them to basically pay for the movement of not only themselves, but goods and services across the rail network, across the highways and through the air at airports. So are we gonna have to have a major catastrophic collapse in one of our infrastructures before we really put the money towards our roads and fixing them? Or are we Boy. just gonna say, what's gonna happen? Because we don't seem to wanna put the money to it to do that. That's, you know, I, I would hate to see that happen. That did happen in, in Minnesota with I-35 when the bridge collapsed. And um, I thought at that point in time that, you know, it would spearhead That would the open discussion. up people's eyes, right? It would open everyone's you would eyes. Think so, right? And it did. I, I'm not saying, you know, that tragedy didn't, didn't result in something. But, but it did what? Not, what did it do? It, 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 
Yeah, well, well, I think in bridge inspections, some other things on a technical standpoint, it, it brought to light. But more importantly, no, it did not. It did not uh, drive the discussion for more infrastructure funding. I, I wish it would have, but it didn't. So no, I I wouldn't want to rely on a national disaster on an infrastructure standpoint to make that uh, come to the forefront to drive infrastructure funding. We're not doing enough. I'm hoping we can open people's minds, hearts, and wallets to understand how both sides need to get to the table. We're at a critical time right now to invest. Thank you, Dave Crossan, Division Operations Officer and Senior Vice President of HNTB Corporation. I recently had the opportunity to sit down with Michael Bellman, President and CEO of the Associated Builders and Contractors, to discuss economic trends such as the business climate, workforce development, policy, tax reform, and infrastructure, and how these will impact the future forecast for 2019. Let's hear what he had to say. Michael, welcome to the show. Peggy, thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. So, Michael, what's your take on the climate of the construction industry right now? Uh, 2018, solid. Uh, $1.3 trillion in spend. Confidence is high. 2019 looks pretty good. Um, pretty solid as well. So is the worker shortage having a real impact on the construction industry right now? It's the number one constraint for growth, according to our members. Uh, they just can't find all the skilled people they need to be able to compete on all the work opportunities that are out there, which is okay because it's causing them to be very selective, which obviously drives up profits. That idea of being selective, is it good or bad? Because we're putting a lot of pressure on those best workers. Do we need to be careful about that, especially when it comes to safety? Yeah, we always got to be careful about uh, safety. Absolutely. Safety is the number one priority in construction, critical uh, to be able to be safe as well as deliver productively, deliver with quality while your clients. So the workforce shortage uh, certainly does put some constraints on that. Uh, but uh, up in the game with regards to safety, education, onboarding, pre-task planning, uh, putting in good near miss communication processes, all of that really has been what uh, the construction industry has been doing to continue to drive down uh, total recordable incidence rates, which have had a great trend uh, over the last 10 years. Are we doing enough as an industry, as the administration, to get the next generation, millennials, Generation Z, to be involved in this industry? Because it's a great industry and it offers great careers. Uh, this administration, Peggy, has done more for this industry in the last two years than previous administrations, I think, combined. Listen, when I was in when I was in eighth grade, I took shop class. That's where I learned how to weld. Good I learned you. how to bend steel. I learned how to lathe wood. Uh, that's when I learned about the construction industry. You know, shop class isn't common in our schools anymore. And when you only give promotional materials for college to the guidance counselors, you know, it's like you got to go to college. You know, careers in technical education just aren't on the minds of those kids in school. And I think that that's been a systematic uh, flaw that we've had to battle. And this administration has been doing a lot to, you know, overcome that with expanding apprenticeships, uh, getting that apprenticeship task force with uh, Secretary DeVos, Secretary Ross, Secretary Acosta. A lot of those recommendations are flowing through congressional bills right now uh, with Perkins getting renewed, Prosper, uh, and uh, recently, first step with regards to uh, opening up the uh, workforce opportunities to uh, nonviolent felons. Why does this administration seem to get why construction is so important and careers in construction and the trades are so valuable? Because we talk about technology, why that's so great, but yet we are going to always need the trades. It's a career and their jobs that are so viable. It's not always that you need to go to college. College is great, but the trades are so valuable. And why does this administration get that? Well, first of all, our president is a developer. I think he's very familiar with the construction industry. Yep. Uh, Secretary Ross, uh, he spent some time in the steel industry. Uh, I think the really the reality is the leadership uh, are business people. 
They understand what it takes to get things done. So, and I think they value not only the white collar worker, but also the blue collar worker. They value the opportunity to work with your hands, learn lifelong skills, and they recognize this system has really you know, took a shift towards just focusing on college, and they know the numbers. You know, 30% of high school grads don't go to college. I think 59% of those who do graduate uh, from college. So there's a lot of opportunities in careers in technical education, whether it's construction or manufacturing, and they see that as the lifeblood of our country. When we look at this, how does your associations, what, your, what are your policies, what are you focusing on right now to really help this industry? Because I know there's a lot of things that you see that are important as well. Well, in the first couple of years of this administration, there's been some really, really good things that have happened. You already talked about the focus on workforce development, expanding apprenticeships, Prosper, Perkins, all those things are really good. Uh, we need to continue that over the next two years. Tax reform has been significant. Um, I'll use the small business tax, you know, the pass-through tax. That is key. 98% of construction companies employ 100 people or less. And those same construction companies employ about 71% of the workforce. So this pass-through tax, as well as the family estate tax expansion, really have been helpful for, helpful for our industry. Because at the end of the day, our CEOs look for predictability. They look for confidence. They see an administration that sees, uh, you know, wants to reward job creators. And at the end of the day, another dollar that flows to the bottom line is a dollar that is invested in hiring new workforce, hiring or buying, buying some more equipment and investing in technology. And that's enabling our member companies to grow, the industry to grow. When we talk about that, we're seeing right now some growth, but we also have to be concerned in an industry that weathers a lot of storms. We've had a few really big recessions in this industry right now. Do we have our contractors saying, look, we've got to be careful because margins are always tight. And even though things are good right now, at any moment, the industry could see things as their confidence changing. Are we looking at your members saying, look, right now we feel good, but we see when things can go the other way? Well, listen, uh, uh, life's lessons, people don't forget, okay? And we've got some recent lessons uh, in the industry, which, is, uh, which were pretty remarkable. So our members are cautiously uh, optimistic, but they're very cautious with regards to those learnings. So at the end of the day, when they hire another person or buy another piece of equipment, they take that decision very, very seriously. And we've got a job creator friendly administration that wants our members and wants the industry and job creators to be successful. The rollback of all the regulations trying to lower the cost of doing the business in terms of compliance, that's another huge benefit uh, that this administration's brought to our industry as well as others. We need to continue with that so that the CEOs have the confidence to make that investment. So the next two years are very critical for this construction industry, the administration, to continue on this path of building a stronger construction industry, building a stronger administration so we could see better infrastructure, better building, better homes, better all the things that we want. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I think going forward from a policy perspective, we'd like to see tax 2.0 happen. What does that do? Well, that makes all of the tax reform uh, you know, law permanent. That's critical. Why is that critical? Because it sunsets in 2025. Once again, CEOs like certainty. They like predictability. So making that permanent is critical. There's another point in tax 2.0 that's really exciting. The expansion of scope for 529s to allow those funds to be used for careers in technical education tax-free in addition to college education. So that's that will be really, really key. Continue with deregulation, very important. That is uh, That sends confidence, it makes it confidence for CEOs and they have a belief that the government is for them, not assaulting them. And then of course, infrastructure. 
you know, we got some bipartisan interest in infrastructure. It would be great to make that happen. Not a stimulus bill, but a good, solid, strategic infrastructure bill. Well, we're looking at a lot of positive things, and maybe if we can start getting more of these Generation Z, right? It's going to surpass the millennials, and it would be exciting to see that, see infrastructure, see buildings, homes, in all of these things come together, right? It would be a positive time for our, our industry. Absolutely, and I think our industry is one of the best kept secrets in terms of career paths. We have people that come into our industry, learn a craft, they learn another craft, they build the skills. The next thing they know, they're starting their own business and they're hiring people and they've lived the American dream. That's wonderful. Michael Bellman, president and CEO of the Associated Builders and Contractors, thank you for spending time with me today. Peggy, fantastic day. Thank you very much for having me. I want to leave you with three thoughts and tips for the year ahead as it relates to our nation's infrastructure. First, we need funding in order to improve our infrastructure. Perhaps this goes without saying, but there are some things you can do to help in this area. Get involved, and that means call your representatives to encourage more investment in our infrastructure, or even simply just share with your friends, families, and even colleagues the knowledge you have about the state of our current infrastructure. You've been watching this TV show so you understand all the videos that we've been putting up. Help them understand that investment is so sorely needed. Not tomorrow, but immediately. It can't wait. We need to put our tax dollars to work today. Next, streamline your processes. As I mentioned earlier in the show, I absolutely applaud our current administration for looking at how to streamline the project permitting process. We need to figure out ways to save costs and complete projects faster. Technology can certainly help, but permitting is just one example. Everyone across the entire life cycle of a project, from subs to GCs, can leverage technology to help along this entire process. Finally, embrace the concept of smart infrastructure. I can't emphasize this enough. This includes everything from new approaches to advanced materials and technologies. We need to build a more resilient, sustainable, and smart infrastructure. We all need to come together to make it happen. Government, construction, and technology providers. But it starts with each of all of us in a group taking an active role, and that means you. And that means all of us working side by side. Thanks for watching Construct Tech TV, your fierce advocates for construction.